Okay, at this time we have our first presenter, Patrick Nolan, joining us. Patrick will be presenting on understanding the patent examination process. Joining Patrick will be Leonard Chen. At this time, I will turn the presentation over to Patrick to start the presentation. Good afternoon to all of you. I'd like to thank Sean for inviting me to come and discuss the patent examination process with you. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background about myself for a minute and then introduce my colleague, uh, Leonard Chang, in which Leo can then give you his background. I've been at the USPTO uh, for 24 years now. I was a biotech patent examiner for about 10. And over the last 14 years, I've been working in the Office of Patent Training as someone who developed and delivered training predominantly on patent examination policy to not only people in the USPTO, domestically to some of our stakeholders, but also internationally. Leo, if you would kindly take a moment to introduce yourself, please. Sure, thank you, Patrick. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Leonard Chang. Um, I am a academy trainer with the Office of Patent Training. Um, and in my role, I am responsible for the supervision and training of new examiners joining the agency. Um, I joined the agency in 2007 um, and have been an examiner until about 2014, where I joined the Office of Patent Training in my current role. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Leo. Leo will be uh, viewing uh, the chat box. Uh, we will have a, an interactive presentation today. We have some time at the end for dedicated questions. Please feel free to either wait until that time or if you wish to interact, um, if you wish to use the chat box, you can do so. Um, that would be fine. Leo will let me know. And if I'm at an appropriate time in which I can stop and ask a question, I'd be happy to do so. But if you'd like to wait till the end of the presentation to ask your questions, we do want to ask as many, answer as many of your questions as we can. We do recognize there's a good number of people online today. So it's unlikely we'll get to every question, but we'd like to get to as many as possible. Okay, so I'm going to begin the presentation. So what do we hope that you will learn at the end of this session? You will hopefully be able to understand and explain the role of a patent examiner, examiner in the examination of an application, explain the actual process of examination, explain the components of an office action, and then explain applicants' rights and responsibilities when responding to an office action. So we'd like to start off by talking a little bit about what patent examiners do, what our roles are. And so um, one of the roles that we have that we take quite seriously is to serve as an advocate and protector of the public interest with respect to intellectual property. So not only do we examine patent applications and grant patents, but in that process, we want to ensure that we actually grant valid patents to ensure that the appropriate scope of an invention is actually what is being granted in the patent. We firmly believe, of course, that a patent helps to promote innovation and promote the ability of people to share information so the technology can advance and also give the ability for the inventor to be able to have a limited monopoly for a certain period of time to prevent others from making, using, selling, or importing their invention. But a component of this is not only from the standpoint of the examination of the application, but also from the standpoint of what we're granting as a legal document. Patent examiners also are charged to provide direct service and assistance to customers from inside and outside the USPTO. And so we are frequently relied upon for information that's relevant not only to the cases that are examined, but also to the areas that we search. And then lastly, but not least of course, to serve as a judge on a patentability with respect to the invention that's claimed in a patent application under conditions for patentability that are set forth in the law, which is Title 35 of the United States Code, which is federal law. So anytime you're going to get involved in a new area, of course, each area of technology or each area of the law has its own terminology or vocabulary. And so some of the vocabulary that you will hear discussed throughout this presentation and, and in working in intellectual property, specifically at the USPTO, we wanted to kind of discuss with you ahead of time so you kind of had a grounding for when we talk about certain terms. The term allowed 
indicates an application which has been indicated by an examiner as meeting all of the laws and rules, and but it's not patented yet, it may or may not have been published. Okay, so the difference between allowed and patented is an allowed patent application which has been which has been issued. One of the major functions of the USPTO is to actually publish patents. It's a big part of what we do at the USPTO to share knowledge so as to forward technology and allow other people to use the information in our databases of patents to help them take the next step in invention. Okay, so publishing is a very large component and a very important function of the USPTO. So in addition to allowed and patented, the terminology of abandoned indicates an application which is no longer pending and was not patented. This abandonment can, be, can occur what's called expressly as requested by applicant or if the applicant does not respond within a certain time period to some type of communication from the office. The case will go abandoned in response to that. Okay. In addition, published patent application. Applications that are filed at the USPTO, not all of them, but the vast majority of them, are published as what's part of what's called PGPUB or pre-grant publication in accordance with a law under 35 U.S. Code 122B. And then the last terminology that we would like to share with you is what's called pendency. And this is something that the office measures, and it's the time from a patent application's filing date until the date a patent is issued or the application is abandoned. So this graphic that I'm showing you in front of you is something we're going, I'm going to refer to many times throughout the presentation, and it's called a simplified patent examination process. And so each of these circles and then arrows that come from them, we're going to discuss in some detail as you get an understanding of what patent examination is all about. Essentially what's going to occur is the examiner, once they actually get the application, will do what's called a first examination, which will usually, under most normal circumstances, although not always, result in a non-final office action. Sometimes what will occur in response to a non-final office action is applicant will respond appropriately and at times will sometimes receive an allowance, okay? The vast majority of the time, applicant responds to the particular rejection set forth by the examiner. And then the examiner does what's called a second examination. And then usually, but not always, issues a final office action. And then that final office action, applicant has a couple of choices to make. They can either appeal the decision from the examiner, and then that appeal is reviewed by the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, or they may take the final office action from the examiner and in some circumstances ask for another round of an examination, which is called an RCE, or Request for Continuation. Or a third option, after they receive that final office action, is they could potentially resolve the issues with the examiner and then receive a notice of allowance. Or lastly, they may not even respond to the second office action, and over a period of time, the case could become abandoned. We will come back to this graphic throughout this particular presentation. So what are some of the things that patent examiners do? What are they responsible to do when they examine an actual application that you might be filing? What they do before they search is they're supposed to read and understand the actual invention that's set forth in the specification. This is really important for the examiner to do because they get an idea of what applicant feels that they actually invented that was new, okay? In addition to reading and understanding the invention, they determine whether that application is adequate to define the meets and bounds of the claimed invention. And when we say the meets and bounds here, essentially what we're trying to say is, has applicant claimed their invention clearly so that one of the skill that works in your field would understand exactly what it is that you're claiming? And then one of the last things that the examiner does before they start searching is they're going to determine the scope of the claim. That's going to be quite important because what the protection that's actually being provided by applicant, if the application becomes an issued patent, is the claimed invention. And so depending upon how scope, the broadness of that scope of the claim determines upon how broad that patent is. So the examiners have to determine what the scope of those claims are so they can adequately and properly search to see whether or not anyone has prior to applicant done the claimed invention. So 
So in the next stage, what an examiner will do is they will start searching. And they actually spend a good amount of time searching the existing technology for the claimed invention. And so what the examiner is doing in this circumstance is they're using a lot of in-house databases and external commercial databases to take a look at the prior art, see what had been done prior, and see what's currently being done in that particular field. Okay. Once they've done the pre-search activities and the search activities, they then are going to write up a office position in the form of what's called a, usually a non-final office action. So the examiner is then going to write an office action which identifies and analyzes all the issues that are pertinent to whether or not the claimed invention is patentable. And as I indicated previously, while it does not always occur, the majority of the time, the examiner is going to be letting the applicant know what is preventing them from being able to get an issued patent. Okay, because the examiner, as I stated in one of the previous slides, is a judge facing the determination as to whether or not the claimed invention is patentable based upon the laws. Okay. So in addition, the examiner, once the applicant responds to that first office action, will respond completely to what's called applicant's reply. And that's at a different stage in examination. And then lastly, if the applicant doesn't reply to one of the office actions or expressly abandons the application, the examiner may be issuing a notice of abandonment or if applicant completely responds and overcomes all of the rejections and objections in the case, and we'll get to that in a moment, they'll issue a notice of allowance. So these are some of the patent examiner responsibilities during the examination of a case. So what is this office action that I just made reference to? This office action is an actual legal record. And the document is supposed to set forth the legal basis for an objection, a rejection, and any indications of allowable subject matter. The office actions are available to the public on www.usp2.gov if the application has become published. I indicated previously the vast majority of our applications that are filed do, do become published. However, not all do. This office action is really quite important because if an issued patent goes to any court proceedings, the actual court will be taking a look at the correspondence of the office through the office action and applicant or applicant's representative to determine what happened during prosecution. And it is given substantial weight by the courts. Okay? The office action also aids the public, those people who might be reviewing the file, and the courts with the underlying rationale behind the history. Excuse me, let's sneeze. So when an examiner, excuse me, when an examiner must, um, when the examiner writes an office action after examining an application, the office action must be consistent with the policy of the office. And so where does an examiner receive and review and apply the policies of the office? And they receive them from three sources. Predominantly, what's called the Manual of Patent Examining Procedures, or the MPEP. Okay. Another area that the examiner can receive policies of the office are what are called published guidelines. These are either interim or final, and they're used between the MPP. The MPP is a very large document, and while it does get updated, it's not updated every month. So a lot of times between MPP updates, we have guidelines that we received. And then there are circumstances in which we have internal, unpublished positions that provide guidance to the examiners on how to examine certain circumstances. Okay? So this is what this office action comprises. So when I indicated about the fact that the examiner is a judge and they're applying the law, that law is found as a statute. And it's Title 35 of the United States Code. This is federal law that examiners are applying. Okay? The statutes are enacted by Congress and signed by the President. Okay? The USPTO, as a part of the administrative branch of the federal government, does not have the authority or to waive or interpret laws inconsistent with the binding case law. And the binding case law 
is, of course, what's going to happen from the judiciary branch okay, as it interprets the laws that are set forth by the legislature and then signed by the president. These statutes under Title 35 are the basis for the rejection of a claim. And if you have seen an app, a rejection on a particular claim from an application that you have submitted, you may have seen 35 USC 101, 102, 112, or 103. We'll go into those a little bit in a moment, but those are the actual statutes. Okay? If a claim has been twice rejected, the applicant at that point has the opportunity to appeal. They can appeal that rejection of claim that's been rejected twice to the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. And that's an administrative board separate from the examination, but within the USPTO that will determine usually a three-judge panel, though not always, as to whether or not the examiner or the applicant has made the most appropriate case as to whether or not the claim should maintain, be maintained in being rejected or should be reversed. So if the PTAB affirmed the examiner's rejection, indicating they felt that the examiner made the appropriate determination, that judicial review from the PTAB may be also appealed. And at that point, you then leave the administrative branch of the federal government, and you can go to what's called the Court of Appeals of the Federal Circuit, or the CAFC, or to the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia, both of which are now in the judiciary. In addition to statutes, examiners are also required to take a look at an application to make sure that it complies with the rules. And the rules are under Title 37 of the Code of Federal Regulations. Once again, these are federal rules. Okay? In contrast, though, to the United States Code and the laws, the USPTO does have the authority to make changes in certain instances subject to the approval of the Office of Management Budget to the CFR, or the Code of Federal Regulations. And the USPTO does have the authority to waive or interpret the rules. Okay. So if a rule is applied to a particular application that has been submitted by an examiner, it is the basis for what's called an objection to any part of an application, which can also include the claims. For example, a claim is required to end with a period. It's required to be a single sentence. And so there are certain circumstances in which the examiner may object just to the formality of the claim. And that might be an objection and not necessarily what would be called a rejection. Okay. So once an examiner objects to a claim or to an application and that required is made final, applicant can seek redress by petitioning the examiner's holding. And then the petition is decided by certain appropriate USPTO officials. And some petitions are handled within what's called the Technology Center, and then some are sent outside the Technology Center to other officials. And in MPEP Chapter 1000, it directly indicates which petitions are decided by which deciding officials, depending upon the type of petition. Okay. Lastly, if both a rejection, which would be for a statute, and an objection, which would be for a rule, are present, those related matters that are part of the rejection and the objection may be decided by the PTAB. So let's talk a little bit about the basis for rejection. There are essentially going to be four statutes under which an examiner is going to reject claims in the vast majority of applications that are filed. The first one is 35 United States Code, Section 101. And this, the basis for this rejection is whether or not the inventions are patentable, eligible to be patented by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Okay? So there are clear determinations as to what the USPTO will grant as a patent. And 35 U.S.C. 101 dictates which inventions are patentable. Okay. Next, 35 U.S.C. 112, United States Code Section 112, determines whether or not the specification that applicants submitted was sufficient to 
to describe the actual invention that applicant is trying to claim to get a patent on. That's 35 U.S.C. 112, the actual specification. Okay. The next basis for rejection is called 35 U.S.C. 102. And under this particular circumstance, the conditions for patentability, what's called novelty, which indicates whether or not applicant's claimed invention was the first inventor to claim a particular invention. So whether or not they were the first ones to have done it based upon the claimed invention. And then the last statute as a basis for rejection is called 35 U.S.C. 103. And those are conditions for patentability called non-obvious subject matter. So while someone may not have done the claimed invention, the prior art would lead one to believe that one could have done it and would have been motivated to do it, and therefore it would have been obvious to do. And those are called 103 rejections, or 35 U.S.C. 103. Okay. So, in a little bit of further depth with each of these statutes, under 35 U.S.C. 101, Section 101 dictates the fact that you, at the USPTO, can only receive one patent for one invention. Okay, so it prevents the person from trying to get a single patent covering two inventions. It also dictates that applicant must have the proper inventor named okay, under Section 101. It also dictates what's eligible to be patented by the USPTO. It must fall invention within one of the four categories of what's called patent eligible subject matter. A process, a machine, an article of manufacture, a composition of matter, or improvements thereof. And so the improvements there are not considered a separate category, but they're in a, an improvement of one of the first four. And then B under eligibility, not directed to what's called a judicial exception. Okay. And this is where it gets a little tricky when it comes to 101, but essentially the courts have dictated that there are certain exceptions that will not allow us to grant a patent. Like for example, we at the USPTO do not grant patents on mathematical algorithms in and of themselves. If they have something what's called significantly more than just an algorithm like its use in doing something, that may raise to the bar of being eligible but that a string of numbers in and of themselves or an algorithm in and of itself is not eligible. But the use of the string of numbers or the use of the algorithm for something that's significantly more than just the algorithm or the string of numbers may be eligible. Okay. And lastly, under 101, the invention must be specific, substantial, and have what's called credible utility, a believable use by those working in the field. Under 112, as I indicated before, this is discussing predominantly the specification. Okay. And so the specification requirements discuss the fact that applicant has to describe what their invention is in such a clear manner that one of skill in the art would say that they have what's called possession of the invention. In addition, under enablement, applicant is required to tell us how to make it and how to use it. Okay. Lastly, for the specification under 112, applicant is required to tell us the best way in which to practice their invention, which is called best mode. 112 also encompasses what is called claim requirements because the claims come at the end of the application. And so under 112, the claims are required to particularly point out and be clear, not vague, and distinctly claim. They cannot be indefinite. We have to know the meets and bounds of what applicant is trying to claim as their invention. And then lastly, 112 will also sometimes in circumstances dictate the format, okay, whether or not it claims what's called independent, dependent, and whether it's multiple dependent. And so in order to address and understand the scope of the claim, the format of the claim has to be clearly demonstrated so that the public and the examiner understand the scope of the claim. 
35 U.S.C. 102 and 103, when an examiner makes a rejection under these statutes, they are commonly referred to as what's called prior art rejections, meaning they're going to rely upon art or publications that are available or knowledge that's available prior to applicant's filing date and utilize that prior art knowledge in making rejections under what's called 102 or 103, 35 U.S.C. Section 102, 35 U.S.C. Section 103. Okay. Under 102, it indicates the fact that the applicant's claimed invention must be new. And if it's not new and the prior art describes every element of the claimed invention, it then anticipates it. And if it anticipates it, there's no difference between the prior art disclosure and the claimed invention. And in that circumstance, the examiner may write a rejection under 35 U.S.C. 102. 35 U.S.C. 102, the statute also defines what's eligible to be used as quote unquote prior art by the examiner during the examination of an application. 35 U.S.C. 103, on the other hand, it's a little trickier. And then you have to make a determination called non-obviousness. And essentially under 103, what it basically indicates is that while your claimed invention had not been done to completion prior to you filing your application, that someone looking in the prior art would have been able to combine two, three, or maybe even four references or more to be able to get to the claimed invention as currently claimed and would have had a reason to do so, okay? And then in doing so, it would have been obvious to a skilled artisan, someone working in that field, to have done your invention or the invention prior to the time it was filed at the USPTO. I would like to remind you that the slide decks and this slide deck that I'm using in this particular presentation will be available after the actual program. So for those of you who have concerns about being able to review this, you will have access to it. Thank you. Okay. So when we talk about prior art rejections, the type of prior art that most commonly is relied upon by examiners are what are called these are reference documents such as patents, like foreign or domestic patents. These are patents that were available publicly, okay? sometimes filed before applicants' application. And so issued patents commonly are used as prior art. Patent application publications. Remember we talked about a PG pub prior. So where the application itself becomes a published document. And those could be international, foreign, or domestic publications. And then the last common type a prior art that's a lot of times used by examiners is what's called non-patent literature, which you may hear abbreviated as NPL. In these are books, journal articles, things found on the web, okay? Any type of information that the examiner can rely upon, upon after doing their search that was available to the public prior to the applicant's filing date and qualifies as prior art, as identified under 102, can be utilized by the examiner as prior art for prior art type projections. Okay. All right, so another type of prior art that is used by applicant is what's called admitted prior art or applicant admitted prior art. And in these circumstances, the applicant in their actual background of their invention will indicate what has occurred prior to their invention. And so the examiner is allowed to utilize that information that's been admitted by the applicant as prior art in making prior art rejections. Okay. And the rules that I was talking about prior, 37 CFR, there are certain rules that dictate how prior art can be made part of the record in a patent application. Okay. All right. So, what are some of these ways in which prior art is made part of the application? Okay. We can have what are called third party submissions, right? So when an application publishes, there are mechanisms by which a third party, the first party being the applicant, 
the second party being the USPTO, the third party being separate from those two parties, can submit information for the examiner to consider. So members of the public may submit relevant references within six months after the application publishes as a PG pub, okay, unless of course the notice of allowance was already mailed. Okay. In addition, there are certain circumstances in which the examiner can require information that only applicant may know, and that's called a 37 CFR 1.105 request for information. Okay. All right, so we're gonna start talking a little bit. I missed one slide, forgive me. I scrolled too quickly. In other ways in which art can be made part of the application is when the examiner examines the application they may apply prior art references and send them as part of an office action. That is the most common way. The second most common way is what's called an information disclosure statement. Applicant is under the duty to disclose any information that's material to patentability. Okay? And they normally will fulfill this request by filing what's called an information disclosure statement. And the examiner is required to consider the references cited on the IDS, or Information Disclosure Statement, as part of their examination. So I've already talked about these two submissions, third party, and then 105s, or requirements for information. So I made reference to the fact that we're gonna come back to this graphic. We are back to it because we've talked a little bit about how the statutes are applied. We've talked about how the examiner considers prior art. And we talked about the fact that after the examiner reviews the application, does a search, the first thing they're going to do is write up a non-final office actions most of the time. Not always. Sometimes an examiner will do a search, review the application, and the claims are in condition for allowance. And the office would consider that a first action allowance. Um, to give you some indication of its rarity, in just my own circumstance only, um, when I was an examiner for 10 years, I did a single first office action allowance. Picked up the case, reviewed it, all the formalities were in good shape, all the statutes had been complied with, did a prior art search, it was clean. There was no prior art, and it met 112 and met 101. So a first action allowance was issued, and I did it once in 10 years. It doesn't mean it can't be done, it's just not common. So the majority of the time, when the examiner reviews an application, they will issue what's called a non-final office action. So when an applicant submits their filing fees, they are paying for two rounds of examination of an, ex of an initial application. Okay? So we're going to talk a little bit about this non-final office action. Okay? So in this non-final office action, one of the things that you're going to see as part of the office action is what's called an office action summary sheet, which is being shown to the right here. And this office action summary sheet lists a lot of really important information. Not only does it tell you what happens to the claims, but it's also going to tell you a lot about what's being attached to the office actions. At the bottom of it, it has a lot of attachments that might be attached. It might have notices of references. These are references the examiner is citing for certain rejections that they're making. It also may have interview summary if there was an interview in the case, information disclosure statements if they were submitted by applicant. Okay. The office action and the office action summary sheet, they give detailed reasons and they support why an applicant's not entitled to a patent at the time that will accompany. And this office action summary sheet accompanies the actual written office action that's submitted after it. So, note in a particular, the type of office action, final or non-final, and the shortened statutory period for reply is also indicated on the office action summary sheet. We indicated previously in the beginning of the presentation that quite often um, there are multiple routes for final disposition, allowance, and in some circumstances, abandonment. Well, this office action summary sets forth the period for reply that's really important that you look at that and understand that you have a certain time period upon which to put reply to the actual office action. You must comply with that, otherwise the case may go abandoned. Okay. 
So after the office action summary sheet, you then actually will start taking a look at documents as being shown on the screen here, which is the actual written office action. Okay, and in the written office action, quite frequently the written office action will indicate some of the formality issues, some of the rules that haven't been complied with. For example, there might be something, an issue with the drawings. Usually after the formalities, it will then get into the actual laws. It will state the actual statute that the examiner is relying upon and then potentially make an actual rejection saying which claims are rejected based upon which statute in view of which prior art if it's a 102 or 103 prior art type rejection. And lastly, all office actions will conclude with how to contact the examiner okay, and the time periods in which you can normally contact the examiner to be able to reach them either by telephone or any other means by which you can, have, you can contact the examiner and how you can access the actual office action in PAIR. It's called the Patent Application Information Retrieval System, or PAIR. Okay? So, once the non-final has been sent out to applicant, applicant is then required to respond to the rejection. Okay? And in responding to the rejection, we're going to talk a little bit about what happens then. The applicant must respond to all formal objections, those are rules, and rejections, those are law. And a lot of times the response will contain amendment to the claims or arguments, and most commonly both. And must make sure, of course, that all of the replies must be filed timely in response to the per time period set forth according to the rules. Okay? And then how you actually make amendments in a case, there's a rule for that. 121 governs how you make amendments in an actual application. Also, the applicant's response must be signed by the appropriate authorized individual, which could be an attorney or the pro se applicant. But if the pro se applicant gives the rights to prosecute the case to the attorney, then it's the attorney that has the right to do so. And in the actual slide deck, there's a link to some amendment formats that are available if you wish to take a look at them. So. Once the examiner receives applicant's response to the rejection, the examiner will do what's called a second examination. The second examination can end up in a notice of allowance. If the applicant replies completely and persuasively to all of the issues in the case, the examiner may actually issue a notice of allowance. Okay? Or the examiner may issue what's called a final office action because now the examiner has reviewed the case twice and then there are still statutory issues with the case as to why rejections, either new ones have been made or the same ones that they made in the non-final have been maintained. And then that leads to what's called a final office action. Okay. So a final office action may occur on the second or later examination of the application if there are claims that are not allowable. Okay. The final office action will notify the applicant of the examiner's final patent determination. It can include objections, rejections, and in some circumstances, it has all three. There may be some objections to the case, some rejections of claims, and some of the claims may actually be indicated as allowable. Once again, the office action sets forth what time period the applicant has to respond. And at the point in which the examiner has done a second round final office action, prosecution is considered closed. And so applicant's ability to continue examination is quite limited at that point. Okay? Applicant can file what's called an after final to have, to have the examiner reconsider some of the points made if they wish to. Okay? So this after final rejection is something that they can file for the examiner to consider. Okay? They file a reply after the final rejection. Okay? In addition, after the final rejection, they can also appeal, in which they can go to the board, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. Or they can also request what's called continued examination, which if we go back to our graphic, it shows that once that final office action is mailed out by the examiner, the applicant could submit what's called an appeal brief and then get it reviewed by the Patent Trial and Appeal Board because they feel that the examiner made the incorrect legal determination 
for the rejection of their claims. At least one claim has to be rejected twice. The applicant could come in and re sufficiently re re address all of the examiner's concerns. And if the examiner is properly feels like it's been accurate legally, they could potentially issue a notice of allowance at that point. Okay, if the examiner doesn't have to do any more substantial searching on the case. And then lastly, after the final office action is submitted, another route the applicant can do is they can say, we, we don't want to file an appeal brief. We would like to have another round of prosecution and in, interact with the examiner. And they consider what's called a request for continued examination. And then that puts the case back to a first examination with the examiner that handled the case. Okay, so in this graphic, it's showing that the examiner's final rejection can be appealed and then reviewed by the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. Okay, so when you appeal the examiner's twice rejected claims, okay, the there are certain papers that have to be filed along with the, with the appeal. You have to file a notice of appeal, an appeal brief, and the appropriate fees. <clears throat> and the appeal brief and the notice of appeal and the fees are all found in MPEP sections 1204 and 1205. Okay. So in addition, as I indicated before, rather than going for an appeal, after a final office action, the applicant can file what's called a request continued examination. And in a request for con continued examination, what will happen is the office will withdraw the finality of the last office action. Whatever they submit with the request for consideration, whether it's new claims, amended claims, or additional arguments, the finality of the last office action will be, en will be entered and it will be sent back to the examiner for a new round of prosecution. Okay. So an RCE is not the filing of a new application. The application maintains its initial application number. So in addition to either filing an appeal brief or request for consider or continued examination, a third option after a final office action would be either what's called a notice of allowance or an abandonment. So we can talk a little bit about that now. Under an allowance, if applicant properly replies to the final office action and there's no new issues for the examiner to consider, the examiner could issue what's called a notice of allowability. Being shown on the slide deck here is this notice of allowability head sheet. And the notice of allowability and the issue fee due will normally accompany it. Okay. So, some terminology just to refresh your memory. Allowance, issue, and after patent grant when it comes to some of these things that are important. An allowance refers to the decision-making aspect of the actual process. Once you've complied with all the rules and the statutes, an application can become allowed. Issue refers to the administrative and procedural aspects of the process of actually getting the application issued as a U.S. patent. Okay, so an application is issued after a decision to allow has, of the application has been made by the examiner. And so we have an entire publication branch that will take allowed applications and get them to the point of issued. Okay. After the patent is granted, there are what are called maintenance fees for utility patents that are due at three and a half, seven and a half, and eleven and a half years after the patent issue date to maintain the ability for the patent to be enforced. Okay. And after the patent grants, there are ways in which you can still make corrections to the issued patent. And that's through what's called certificate of correction or what's called a reissue. One thing that I didn't go into detail about in the different stages of examination that I would like to discuss is what's called interview practice. The USPTO encourages examiners to take a proactive approach to examination by reaching out and having a back and forth good conversation via interview with the stakeholders. Okay, so we have a lot of procedures to assist both applicant and the examiners in trying to collaboratively work out the process 
to see if there's a patent that can be issued from the application. The, app, the interview can take over the phone or WebEx or with the, either the pro se or the applicant's attorney agent of record if there is one. Okay. Note, telephonic video conference interviews will not be recorded. However, the substance will be documented by the examiner in what's called an interview summary, which is a document that then will be mailed to the applicant and or applicant's representative. Okay. In addition to calling the examiner, which you may do, we also have what's called the automated interview request form, which can also be used to schedule an interview with an examiner for a pending patent application. The office does strongly promote, when appropriate, the use of interview practice. Okay, so some additional resources. I'm about ready to wrap up our presentation and I would more than happily take your questions. The patent process overview, if you'd like to take a look at it, when you get the slide deck, you can click on that link and it'll bring you, bring you to the overview of the patent process that we have discussed somewhat throughout this presentation today. Okay, so at this stage, I'd be more than happy to take questions. Um, we can do that in whatever format's appropriate. Sean, if you'd like to unmute or type or whatever's your, whatever mechanism you wish, sir, I'm very open to. Sure, actually I have a few questions for you that have come in. So I'll start with Great. the first one. How is the USPTO helping me if my application is rejected? That's a really good question. I think there are two components um, to that answer. The first component to that answer is that if you receive a rejected application, it is an indication from the examiner's legal point of view that your application in its current state is not allowable, which would mean that if a patent was granted, it would not be enforceable because your patent essentially could be invalidated if the statutes were not properly applied to your case. So there is true benefit to getting a vigorous examination from an, app, from an examiner and getting rejected claims so as to appropriately determine the scope of your claimed invention of your resulting patent so that it can withstand any type of invalidation proceedings once it issues as a patent. So a rejection is the process by which to determine where the appropriate scope of hopefully the resulting patent would issue so that it would stand up to any type of post-grant patent process to try to invalidate your invention. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so Patrick, for our next question, if office actions are legal records, do I need to hire an attorney to help me? No, you do not need to. There are substantial resources for independent inventors and pro se applicants to be able to navigate the system. However, it, you truly the applicant's choice. But if applicant believes that there's a benefit to having legal representation, the office of course receives applicants representation as well as independent inventor representation or pro se independent inventor representation. So no, there's no requirement. So it's purely what is the best in the representation for applicant in their invention. If they feel that they're better presented by, any, by the attorneys, there is a listing of all registered attorneys before the office that they could consider hiring. But there are many resources to allow applicant to independently prosecute an application with the office without attorney representation. However, attorney representation, of course, is always welcomed and worked with in both circumstances. So no, there's no requirement. Okay. So Patrick, the next question is, can you give some insight on the benefits of filing a provisional application versus a non-provisional application? Yes, so provisional applications um, abandon automatically one year after filing. Uh, provisional applications allow you to establish a date in which, with the USPTO, in which you filed the documents appropriately to demonstrate the fact as to the date in which you constructively invented your invention by filing the provisional application. It provides you essentially a one year time period upon which to determine whether or not you wanna go forward with the prosecution of your case. 
Um, another thing that's really quite important about provisional applications is they're not as expensive as non-provisional utility applications. And so it allows you essentially to dip your toe into the water to determine if you want to go forward with this process and to determine whether or not what prior art might be out there on your invention, whether you might be able to get other individuals to help you work with the filing of the application once you go to a non-provisional application. It is essentially an opportunity for you to establish when you invented your application without full-fledged into examination to give you some time to make additional decisions and it doesn't cost you as much. So there are absolute substantial benefits to all filing provisional applications prior to a non-provisional. Thank you, Patrick. So the next question coming in is, what are your thoughts on keeping my invention secret versus applying for a patent? So that's a very good question. I shared with you that one of the major functions of the USPTO is to be a, an office of publication. We disclose, we have, we, there's a true belief here, not only in the USPTO, but I think in the invention community that people use prior disclosures of prior patents as a leapfrog effect upon which to make improvements thereof. Um, from the standpoint of protecting your intellectual property, we are always going to promote the ability for you to disclose and then use the patent system by which to protect your invention. That being said, the different considerations as to how you handle your intellectual property might be something for you to consider based upon what your intellectual property is. In regards to us, patentable, patentable inventions, we feel that there is a true benefit to coming to the USPTO, disclosing what your invention is, receiving the rights that you have from the issued granted patent. However, from the standpoint of certain inventions or intellectual properties, there are benefits to having trade secret information. However, as the USPTO, we are a public disclosure organization as much as an examination organization. So we are always going to believe that there's benefit to the public knowing about your invention and then giving you rights upon which granting the patent. Okay. Patrick, the question is, if you fail to file a response to an office action, is the abandoned date the six month date, or is it the date of the notice the abandonment is mailed? That's a very good question. It actually will be the date in which the six month period occurred, but you do have the ability upon, so the actual notice of abandonment date will be the date in which the statutory period has run out. That will be the date of abandonment. Okay, so sometimes the examiner may not process the notice of abandonment, it may take them some time to process it, but the effective date for the notice of abandonment will be the date upon which this, the statutory period has ended for response. Great. So Patrick, you mentioned pro se, and one of the questions coming in is, when you say pro se inventor, can you explain what that means? Generally in the office, we believe uh, we use the term pro se to indicate someone who does not have um, someone who's authorized to represent clients either as either a patented as an agent or as an attorney in front of the USPTO. So if you are self-representing, normally the, uh, the term pro se would apply to you. So it's, it's individuals who individually prosecute their applications of their own inventions before the USPTO and do not have legal representation. We generally categorize those individuals as pro ses. Thank you. Our next question is, what can be done with a patent after the 18-year patent granted period is over? Well, in actuality, one of the things that we do at the USPTO is we actually travel to a lot of the uh, country, uh, companies throughout the country that uh, use the patent system as a mechanism by which to build their companies. And so the, from a legal standpoint, uh, the legal basis for you to prevent others from making, using, selling, or importing your invention has run its course. But there are many people that use their patent as, um, uh, they're almost, they're very proudful of it. They, they present it on their walls at the beginning of their businesses. They, it demonstrates the fact that they're promoting technology. It demonstrates the fact that they're a, a very successful inventor from the standpoint of the fact that they created something that was new and non-obvious. Um, and so a lot of times actually people will hang their issued patents 
in their actual place of business as a mechanism by which to demonstrate the fact that they have received um, the United States patent as a way in to help promote the ability to create business and continue to fund their businesses. So from a legal standpoint, there isn't much more to do with the patent once it's run its time. But the actual patent itself, there's a lot that can be done in the, in the use of it. The next question is, I keep hearing the ideas, I keep hearing that ideas cannot be protected, but aren't all inventions an idea to begin with? Uh, yes, I would have to say that a lot of inventions are ideas to begin with, but there's a difference between an idea and something that has actually become an invention. And so what happens is there are many more ideas that are maybe might be things that you're thinking, but to become invention, they actually have to be reduced to practice. They actually have to be constructively created. That constructive creation could be as simple as writing it down on a piece of paper or electronically and submitting it as your idea. But an idea, the, the separation between an idea and invention surely has to do with whether you constructively reduce that particular idea in some manner by either filing the patent application, reducing it to practice in the field, whatever it may be, in which you actually take the idea that might be in your head and actually make it something that other people can recognize, look at, and determine what it actually is. From the standpoint of a patentable invention, that invention then has to comply with the different statutes as we set forth, as we talked about in this presentation under 101, 112, 102, and 103. But ideas are ideas. Inventions are taking those ideas and making them constructive, reducing them to practice. Okay. So, Patrick, I think we have time for one more question. And this Great. question is, is there a way to make amendments to an existing patent that was already approved without filing for a new one? We talked about in the presentation that there are mechanisms by which you can actually correct an issued U.S. patent. If it's uh, minor, usually a certificate of correction will do. However, there are certain circumstances, what's called a reissue. And in a reissue proceeding, you may actually and likely will have to submit your patent to the office, and then they will reissue the patent after they've considered whatever changes you might want to make to it, whether you think it might have, for whatever reason, you would like to have the case re-examined or reissued. There are procedures mm -hmm. that you can review in the MPP upon which you can determine whether or not you need to correct your patent, have it reissued, or even potentially re-examined. So yes, there are procedures by which you can do that as the person who owns the patent, yes. All right, Patrick, I'm gonna give you one more question because we do still have time. I have my provisional sure. patent ready for non-provisional application filing. As a pro se inventor, can I have an examiner review my application prior to submitting the final non-provisional application for completeness and accuracy? Uh, generally, no. Um, so what happens is provisional applications are not examined. Um, Non-provisionals are only examined once actually filed. So in actuality, what happens is a, a, an important part of the filing of your non-provisional is the support of, we are supported by filing fees here at the USPTO. So part of that process is you file your application, you pay the fees, and that initiates the examination process. So the answer to the question directly is no, not prior to submission. But after submission, of course, you will initiate the process with the examiner. So there's no examination of a case filing prior to the filing of a non, uh, of an application that's non-provisional. No. Patrick, that is our last question and it does segue into the conversation with our next presenter. So I'm gonna go ahead and thank you and Leo both for your time today.